listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Thank you for letting us share part of your day. My name is Jerry Mitchell. Sitting next to me in her supervisor's chair is Myra. Hello, everyone. <laughs> in my supervisor's voice. <laughs> yes, I noticed that. <clears throat> um, if you're new to us, thank you for giving us a chance. If you've been with us a while, we certainly appreciate you spending some more time with us. It, it Tonight is going to be fun and filled with... Well, you'll see. <laughs> but you're going to hear some things tonight you have probably never heard or thought of before. Probably some things you never wanted to know. So, if you're <clears throat> before we get to all that, don't forget if you visit GiveGod90.com. <clears throat> excuse me, dot com. There is uh, a lot of things going on there. Uh, if you're looking for some good reading material. You know, oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, Tradition to Truth, One Man's Search for Honest Answers, and God's Universe, God's Rules are still available out there. Uh, do yourself a favor and find a local bookstore to get them through. It'll Everybody will appreciate it. Um, what else? Oh, the chat room is open tonight. If you have a free account, you can leave us a message. We always like to see them. Uh, it also, well, that actually helps me know what people are thinking about too as i'm saying things so <clears throat> we appreciate that um don't forget if you like what you hear you know those share buttons you know it takes like half a second to push that um go ahead and, and rate us if you would that helps other people find us as well so it's just out there remember what i try to re what i try to remind you is that you know if you like this Chances are your friends, your family, and even your enemies need to hear it too. So don't be afraid to put it out there. You know, as we look tonight uh, at the collision of faith and politics, and that's what's happening, there is a collision. And when you have a collision, it can be, you know, as gentle as you know maybe scraping a little paint it can be as drastic as tearing things up all of these things kind of work together but this is kind of a different type of collision that we see um, and it is time for believers around the world to stand up and say no Evil cannot and will not win. And it's time for believers to join together and it, across denominational lines, across traditional lines, and say, no more. <clears throat> We're not going to be forced to sin anymore. We're not going to be silent about it. We're not going to be forced to turn the other cheek and hear somebody's false teaching. doesn't matter what it's about because you are probably being fed some things that are not healthy. Um, it, it's There's so much stuff going on in the world today, and I'm not going to limit what I say to American politics because we have people listen all around the world. And one of the things that's kind of tough, be, I'll be honest with you, I used to be patriotic, right? A lot more so than I am now. Um, one of the, one of the things that I have to re remember, especially in speaking to people all over the world is I have to relate to people where they are. So one of the things I do is I search through a lot of news articles in today's time. <clears throat> uh, that includes, uh, the Kajil Times out of United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, Japan Times, uh, Arab World, I think it is, out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I go to Germany for their news. I go to, well, I don't go to Canada anymore because they are just kind of one-sided. <laughs> you know, let's face it. 
<clears throat> Canada's lost. Uh, something that came up, <clears throat> excuse me, today. I noticed an article. I can't remember which uh, website this was from. Pat Robertson came out of retirement. And I wish he'd have stayed in retirement. Pat Robinson came out of retirement and he said that God is directing Putin to evade, invade the Ukraine. Now, he's kind of correct. He doesn't know why he's correct, <clears throat> but he's kind of correct. But if you remember the other day, I said, this isn't the real war. Now, I know if you're in Ukraine or a, a Russian soldier in Ukraine, it feels like real war. And, and I'm not detracting from that. What I mean is the real world war that will be the, the absolute forerunner to everything that's going to happen. Things are still not set in the right places yet for the completion of prophecy. And a lot of people want to do that. And the people who are seeing these things aren't waiting to see what happens. I've gone over that several times, right? <clears throat> now, what, what Robertson is saying, it, it, it just leaves out the timing. And timing in prophecy is everything. We can see things and we think, well, this fits here until it, the event actually plays out. And then we realize, oh, that wasn't what it was about. That's happened a few times. And I'm not just talking about the people who say, well, the world's going to end on such and such a date, and it doesn't. Okay? That, that's, we all know that that's kind of baloney anyway. It, it's just silly distractions and garbage that people say these things just because they want to you know, have their five minutes of fame. They don't even deserve 15 minutes. If you look around the world at what's going on, there are nations that are refusing to participate in the rhetoric of war right now. Many of the African nations are waiting to see how this is going to really play out on the world stage. Uh, some have abstained from votes in the, uh, in the United Nations. Uh, they refuse to commit to anything because they still know that this can be resolved diplomatically. There was no need for Russia to invade. There was no need for all the saber rattling. There was no need for all of the everything that's going on. There's no need for the atrocities uh, that's, that's happening right now. What's really interesting to note here is something I read earlier today. Actually, it was just a little while ago. And it, it caught me off guard. Even I did not see this coming. OK, <clears throat> uh, the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salam, has actually offered to mediate between Russia and Ukraine. But you never saw that coming either. It, you know, typically this is a role that the United States would play. But if you are watching this play out carefully, you will notice that the entire Western Hemisphere, North and South America, really are being ignored to the large extent in what's happening. You know, there's a lot of, of speeches coming out of Washington, D.C. about, oh, we've got to do this and we've got to do this. But they're not paying attention to even what the people in the United States are saying. You know, people in the United States... Uh, are standing more with Ukraine, probably not a bad idea. But here's the thing. They're doing so not because either Russia or Ukraine were right or wrong one way or the other. They're doing so because it's hitting them at a time when inflation in the United States is the highest it's been in 40 some years since Jimmy Carter uh, gas prices are higher than they've ever been and when you get into somebody's pocketbook or checking account bank account credit card uh, bill it gets people's attention and the folks in 
Washington have not figured that out yet. And it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on there, guys. You need to figure this out. <clears throat> but interestingly, Israel has taken a completely different position. And I think it's a position that suits them very well this time. Um, they said, basically, there's Jews living in Ukraine. There's Jews living in Russia. Our concern is for the people, not the politics. They don't really want to be involved with the political platform of either nation. Their concern is for the people of Jewish descent who are living in both Ukraine and Russia. Now, here is a collision of faith and politics, right? Or is it? They're ignoring the political faction. They're saying, we need to take care of people. Actually, they really are putting people first. Amazing. Um, when you put people first, it actually does leave a lot of room for diplomacy. But when you put other things first, when you start finger-pointing at, well, he has more nuclear weapons than we do. No, 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 he has more oil than we do. No, he doesn't. He's just selling it at a better price than we are. That's the kind of, of rhetoric that gets you in trouble, and it leaves the people of these nations in a bad situation. Then you're going to hear the war stories. And there's a lot of those coming out. Um, some are really kind of horrendous. Uh, if you've been paying any attention at all, you may have seen the Russian soldier walking around. He had a grenade in each hand. The Ukrainians were trying to convince him to surrender. That's... I don't, I'm not sure how that ended. But some other stories are more, more heartwarming. Uh, the Russian soldier actually surrendered to the Ukrainians. They gave him a, a cup of warm tea. And one of them uh, took out their phone and said, you know, what's your, what's your mother's phone number? We want to call her and let her know that you're okay. Now... The picture that goes with that story uh, is this soldier talking to his mother, you know, letting her know that he's okay. And then we have other, other things going on. Now, there is in Ukraine a very small segment <clears throat> of neo-Nazi fighters who are part of the Ukraine National Guard. Uh, this segment is known as the Azov Battalion. It's actually considered the most effective against the Russian invasion. The Azov Battalion actually recruits from outside of Ukraine, and it attracts fighters uh, from surrounding nations who lean towards that neo-Nazi way of thinking. They stand against interracial marriage, separating uh, the lesser humans. You know, that's where it comes from, the, the Nazis, right? Uh, and, of course, they are very anti-Semitic. Now, I, I say this to remind everybody that when Putin said he needed to denazify eastern Ukraine, most people didn't understand what he was saying. They thought he was talking about Zelensky. That's not what he was saying. Putin was actually afraid of these people because they are that good at what they do. It should be pretty obvious they actually slowed the Russian army. Now, there's other, some other things going on, too, like weather and, and whatnot that's interfering with Russian advancement. But these folks are tough. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the Chechen Assassination Battalion, or Assassination Squad, I should say, were supposed to be some of the most highly trained, most efficient people. They went in to kill Zelensky. Uh, and they actually fell prey to the Azov Battalion. They weren't that tough. Uh, you know, reputation is only reputation until 
you know, like we used to say, when the tailgate drops, everything stops. Because that's when the rubber hits the road. That's when everything goes down. They might have had a tough reputation, but this little-known group of uh, Azov Battalion, they could get the job done. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying they're that well-trained, they're that dedicated, and they can get the job done. One of the arguments, uh, you know, when the Vietnam War was being waged, that it was so unpopular, was that every night on television, everybody could see how terrible war really is. The reality is that every war prior to that was exactly the same. Uh, people in the United States considered the World War II vets uh, to be men of honor who defeated Hitler. Uh, these men themselves rarely spoke of everything that they saw. They may have talked about some things, but they very rarely, unless they were among themselves, spoke of the worst of the worst. This was a generation who needed to get a job done, and they did the job that needed to be done. That particular job was that of a warrior. Uh, <clears throat> Russian soldiers... Uh, are kind of winning, but a, a very, very high cost is being paid. Uh, you know, they're paying the cost of respect. The, and, and, and it's a way that the world and even their own country view their actions. It taints their wins. And when you win the, by, by let's, let's just say it, when you are attempting to win a war by killing civilians, it's hard to call that victory. Because victory, uh, sort of, well, at least in, in the English way of thinking, the American way of thinking, victory means you have, you have defeated your enemy, but with honor. There is no honor in the way the Russian army is having to fight this. Now, getting back to what Rob, Pat Robertson was referring to, um, and he sort of alludes to this a little bit in the article that I read. He, he, it comes from, actually, Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 5, as Myra reads that. <clears throat> the Lord spoke his word to me. He said, Human being... Turn toward Gog, the land of Magog. He is the chief ruler of the nations of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him. Say, the Lord God says this. I am against you, Gog, chief ruler of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around. I will put your hooks, put hooks in your jaws. I will bring you out with all your army, horses and horsemen. All of them will be finely dressed. They will be a large army with large and small shields. All of them will have swords. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them. All of them will have shields and helmets. Okay. <clears throat> now, Meshach and Tubal are the sons of Japheth. And, of course, their descendants. One of the reasons that we need to know the real names in the Bible is because we need to understand the who's who and, of course, the where's where, right? Uh, scholars have always considered Gog and Magog to be the northern people who now make up Russia. Uh, but look at who joined the fight. Persia, which is now Iran. Cush, which is currently Ethiopia, uh, and Put is Libya and some of the surrounding areas. Now, of course, these current nations with these names used to be much larger. They were uh, areas where people settle. That's how they get their name. Um, and it's amazing that 
after World War II, when they when they started drawing these new lines, I, World War II, World War One. Anyway, when they started drawing these new lines around that area, around the Middle East, and they started dividing it up, things got really confused, and we we don't know now exactly. We have a good idea, but not exactly where the old old boundaries were. Now, when I say old old, I'm talking about. Uh, 26, 27, 2800 years ago. Okay? <clears throat> because the, the original boundaries were, what, 3700 years ago, right after the flood, when Noah's children and his grandchildren began settling in these areas after they left the plains of Shinar. So they went to these areas, and, and these are the areas that are there now. These are the people groups who join with Gog. So as we see what's happening, um, we need to remember that prophecy is centered around the Creator's chosen people. It's centered around the descendants of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. That is who the entire biblical prophecy is centered around. Now, most people would say that on May 14th, 1948, when David Ben Guron, who was the head of the Jewish agency, proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel, that is when Israel became a nation in a day. And Isaiah 66, 8 asks the question, Who has heard such as this? Who has seen such things? Can a country be born in a day, or a nation be delivered in an instant? Yet as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. <clears throat> now it would seem, it would seem that, you know, what happened in 1948 would be the fulfillment of that question. But what well, what was Isaiah referring to? What happened that made Isaiah ask that question? Or I should say write down that question. Well, if we look at Ezekiel 37, we may find an answer. Uh, Ezekiel 37 verses 15 to 23. The Lord spoke his word to me. He said, Human being, take a stick of wood, write on it, for Judah and all the Israelites with him. Then take another stick of wood, write on it, the stick of Ephraim, for Joseph and all the Israelites with him. Then join them together into one stick. Then they will be one in your hand. Your people will say to you, Explain to us, what you mean by this? Tell them, this is what the Lord God says. I will take the stick, which is for Joseph and the tribes of Israel with him. This stick is in the hand of Ephraim. Then I will put it with the stick of Judah, and I will make them into one stick, and they will be one in my hand. Hold the stick of wood on which you wrote these names. Hold them in your hands so the people can see them. Say to the people, this is what the Lord God says. I will take the people of Israel from among the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around. I will bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel. One king will rule all of them. They will never again be two nations. They will not be divided into two kingdoms anymore. They will not continue to make themselves unclean by their idols, their statutes of God, which I hate, or their, or their sins. But I will save them from all the ways they sin and turn against me, and I will make them clean. Then they will be my people, and I will be their God. Hmm. Now, there is a nation of Israel. Many people that, that we know have been there. 
But is this the nation that is being spoken of in Ezekiel? What What's going on here? Jeremiah 3.18 says, In those days the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land that I gave to the fathers for an inheritance. Now if you look at that, um, it's really not in those days. It's in that day, or on that day. Take your pick. Have the two houses actually come back together? Have the two sticks actually joined together? Um, now, these two sticks are often displayed, if you've seen pictures of them, you know, about, they, they seems like they're twisted together like you would twist a wire. Thank you, Jennifer. And if you twist a wire together, it's not really one wire, it's two wires. Even if you solder it together, it's still two. <clears throat> it might seem like one. It has all of the uh, properties of being one, but it's not truly joined together. What, it's, what it reads in Ezekiel is they become one stick, not twisted around each other, uh, but one put together end to end, so it makes one long continuous stick. You take two halves, you put it back together. And when, I'm going to tell you, when the Creator puts it back together, you will not see a band of duct tape around the middle. I mean, it's that simple. He will not use duct tape. It will just be together, just like it was never broken. Uh, the current government in Israel, we know, will be destroyed. We know that because, what's it say? That a descendant of David will be king. The current state of Israel is a form of a democracy. It's not a true kingdom. Now, there may have been some descendants of David who was either president or prime minister. I don't know. haven't looked into their lineage. But I can say that they're not called a king. Because the, the way it's laid out, because of the way it's structured, the state of Israel does not fit the criteria for what's put, or what we read in Ezekiel. Now, we try to force prophecy into some things, but here's one place it, it might seem to fit. We'd like it to fit, but it just, in reality, doesn't fit no matter how hard we try to force it, because not all of the criteria is met. And if all of the criteria is not met, then the prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. Um, vocabulary is extremely important in the Bible. And I said, you know, this is going to be a collision of faith and politics, and, and here's some more of it. We could speculate that what we see happening between Russia and Ukraine uh, is prophetic. And if you stretch it just a little bit, it may be. I don't think we're far enough into the event yet to be able to, to determine if it really is. But I do know, and I will say this very confidently, that it is a step that is going to be putting things in place so that prophecy can be fulfilled in the future. I don't, you know, we don't know exactly how, but I can pretty much guarantee that's what's happening. Uh, the current state of Israel was recognized in a day, but it actually took many weeks of fighting to get to that point. Uh, if you ever have a chance to watch a movie called Cast a Giant Shadow, it is... Uh, a, a semi-fictional story about some real events, okay? Uh, it's an older flick. It has Kirk Douglas and John Wayne and some big names in there. Very, very good movie. Uh, and it gives you some very, very good footage about the old uh, Holy Land. But we have to realize that what happened didn't occur in just one day. It took several weeks. Uh, when, 
when Isaiah said, can it happen in a day? Uh, I think he's talking about something a little different because he's talking about an entire kingdom being formed in a day. <clears throat> and um, there may be a couple of places where the writers actually say in the days or in the day, which would spread it out a little bit, but primarily it does speak of a single day. Uh, Meyer's going to read from uh, Ezekiel 37, 24 to 28. And this, is, this should help us uh, gain some more of those parameters. And my servant David will be their king. They will all have one shepherd. They will live by my rules and obey my laws. They will live on the land I gave to my servant Jacob. It is the land in which your ancestors lived. They will all live in the land forever. They, their children, their grandchildren. David, my servant, will be their king forever, and I will make an agreement of peace with them. It will be an agreement that continues forever. I will put them in their land. I will make them grow in number. Then I will put my temple among them forever. The place where I live will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then my temple is among them forever. The nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy. Okay. So, um, again, the criteria is not met. They're not being led by a king. Uh, they will live by my rules and my laws. Um, they're trying. They're making the effort to a certain degree as closely as in the world right now as they might be able to come in the situation they're in. They do uh, live on the land that was given to them, yes. So there's certain things that we can look at and say, it, it's starting to come together, but what we can't do is say, it's there. Um, part of the reason that so many of the Israelis are wanting to build a third temple is because of what's written here. But that's not going to happen until Israel, the people group, are united in a day. You know, as much as I love and respect the people living in Israel currently and our Jewish friends around the world, we need to recognize that it is mostly the Christian influence more so than the Muslim influence that has prevented current Israel from reaching its greatest potentials. I think I might have just got stepped on some Christian toes right there, maybe. And if you ask how, look at what you've done. You are forcing uh, your messianic prophecies into a place where they're not ready to fit yet. Christians want to make everything about Jesus. Most prophecies, though, are about the people who love and serve the Creator, not just about Jesus. You know, and that's what believers need to concentrate on. You know, we need to reject the concept of Jew or Christian and just do what is written. You know, we need to cross the lines, right? Maybe we need to erase some lines. We don't need to do what's written in our man-made doctrines, right? Because the, the our man-made doctrines, uh, the traditions that we've made up, get in the way. But instead, if we just simply use the Bible as the owner's manual for our lives, what would happen? If every believer would simply put their religion behind them and live the way we are actually designed to live by the Creator, you know, the actions that are currently happening in Ukraine, you would understand our preparations for something larger, a bigger attack, and that attack will be against our Creator. It will be against Jehovah. It won't be against a country. It won't be political. It's going to be religious. 
And it's not a Russia thing. It's not a Ukraine thing. It's not even a USA thing. This is, a, this is plain and simply about good versus evil. Not just in the short term. And we can hope that this is a short war. But this is part of what has been an ongoing war that will only end when the Messiah actually comes to rule with a rod of iron. And that's kind of why you know, I can talk about politics and it doesn't matter what country you live in. It doesn't even matter how old you are, or how young you are, <clears throat> but it matters how you live right now every day. And here's the thing. If you live the way the Almighty designed you to live, guess what can happen? Isaiah 66, 10 through 14. Jerusalem, rejoice. All you people who love Jerusalem, be happy. Those of you who felt sad for Jerusalem should now feel happy with her. You will enjoy her good things and be satisfied as a child is nursed by its mother. You will rejoice. You will receive her good things and enjoy her wealth. This is what the Lord says. I will give her peace that will flow to her like a river. The wealth of the nations will come flowing to her. Like babies, you will be nursed and held in my arms. You will be bounced on my knees. I will comfort you as a mother comforts her child. You will be comforted in Jerusalem. When you see these things, you will be happy. You will grow like the grass. The Lord's servant will see his power. Now, is it any wonder that the, the people of Israel are more concerned with the Jews living in Ukraine and in Russia than they are the politics of the war? The news around the world seems kind of bleak and dismal. But for those who put their trust in the Creator and not in the government they live under, you know, we, you know, we have a saying, uh, <laughs> this is terrible. When, when we hear about a car crash, we always hear it uh, like uh, bus versus car or bus versus uh, bicycle. Uh, maybe sometimes it's truck versus pedestrian. Yeah, or motorcycle, you know who wins, right? You know who loses. But when the when it's a collision between faith and politics, your faith must win. Your trust in the Creator will defeat the false doctrines, the false religion, and all of the traditions if you trust, and if that trust is true and certain. There can't be any doubt. You know, you can't say one day, oh, yes, Lord, I will go with you. And then the next day, well, you know, I've got to pay my taxes. It just doesn't work that way. Who will you, and I'm not saying don't pay your taxes. All right. Don't take me wrong there. What I'm saying is if you trust the almighty creator with everything you've got, you will have what you need to pay your taxes. Did I get myself out of trouble pretty good there? Okay. <laughs> We've looked at some passages tonight that indicate the things we think we have been uh, told or completed may not be complete yet, right? Um We'd have to wait until the end of an event to see how it plays out. We need more information sometimes. So the people who are saying that, you know, like Pat Robertson, oh, God caused Putin to do this. Nah, Putin caused Putin to do this. I think it was greed that drove him to do this. But it, it now, does that mean that, that the Almighty is not going to use it to set things up for another step he absolutely will absolutely he will he's going to be he's going to be getting things together with everything we witness we need to watch very very carefully the messiah is coming at some point 
But what we are witnessing right now are only the pains of labor for the world. Preparing the whole entire world for something better. If the believers are willing to accept it. Our job as believers is to be the example of the people around us. To allow them to see who you trust and and how you witness for and represent the Almighty. Not worrying with tradition, not worrying with doctrine, but actually believing Scripture, actually doing what it says, actually putting it to practice. It's time for faith and trust to defeat politics, not just uh, in the worldly situation, but in your life. Now, we know that things will be far worse. There's going to be atrocities worse than what you're seeing, you know, on whatever social media you're following. There's going to be atrocities much, much worse than what you're seeing on the news or reading about in the paper. If anybody actually reads a paper anymore, I think most people uh, do it electronically. But things right now, as bad as they seem, you know, to, to borrow the phrase, you ain't seen nothing yet, Okay? You ain't seen nothing yet. But the good news is you have been given the ability and you have been given the authority to step away from the politics, the politics of politicians and nations. You have even been given the ability and the authority to step away from the politics of religion. Ooh, did I just say that? Yes, I did. You can do that and live the way the Creator actually designed you to live. And that doesn't include being enslaved by those traditions and doctrines of mankind anymore. You know, depending on the civil rules of the country where you live, it could be more challenging to trust your Creator and represent Him. But you know it's not impossible. Daniel did it, along with his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azrael. Uh, you might know them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, uh, but those are just the most famous people we read about. You know, if everybody was included, you know, you think your Bibles are thick now. If everybody that uh, deserved—well, I don't know about deserved to be in there—but if everybody that was recorded as being righteous, if everybody that was re ever recorded as doing the right thing was included, you'd never get through it. You couldn't read the Bible in five years. You don't, you don't have that kind of faith and only have four people in an entire nation do these things. You, know, you, don't, you don't turn a king's head around and get him to notice what's going on with just a couple of people. It takes more. That's why you are being, that's why you displaying your faith is so important. That's why you doing what is written is so important. Now, you might not think that your witness is important. You might not think that the things you do are drastic or miraculous but it is your witness to offer. You know the young person who uh, at maybe at school or at work who bows their head and prays? Are they any less persecuted uh, by being teased than Daniel was when he was put in the lion's den? Not in the eyes of that young person. Not at all. You know, sometimes people can be more vicious than a den full of hungry lions. Is the person who chooses to hold their pastor accountable when he says something that doesn't match what's in the Bible? Is that person any less persecuted by the rest of the congregation when they say, you can't talk to the pastor like that. He's been to school. You know, you know, he's been to seminary. He knows everything. And that's that's a very uh, 
subdued version of some of the things that I've heard. But that persecution is no less persecution. Sometimes, now, what I'm going about to say might sound funny to some people, but sometimes dying, you may be better off. Because the young person who is teased may choose to change their faith. You know, the one who is challenging the words of a leader, they may fall into the traps of tradition or false doctrine. Those are political traps, make no mistake about that. And as I have said before, killing you is not the worst thing that the enemy can do to you. But creating doubt about who and what the Creator is that leads you to trust someone or something other than the Almighty Himself, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, doubting the Him, causing you to doubt Him, that is the worst thing that the enemy can do to you. There is a collision of faith and politics in the world today. And you can beat it. You can defeat it. You can cause your faith and your trust in your Creator to be number one. And if you need some help with that, visit GiveGod90.com and take that 90-day challenge. People have said, well, you're, you, know, you shouldn't challenge God. Well, it's not a challenge for God. It's a challenge for us. And a lot of people have done it, and a lot of people have been successful. So, little changes you can make every day, and we need more and more people to start right now. Because what's coming, you need, you need the ammunition, and the only ammunition you're going to get is your trust in your Creator. Did you have anything you wanted to add to all of that? I think you've summed that up, but thank you everyone for listening. Absolutely. Don't forget we will be back Monday, and um, hopefully I'll be a lot calmer. So until Monday, many, many blessings, everyone. Mm-hmm.